I think one of the biggest issues is just generally government uh, regulation too much. We've seen a lot of issues in South Dakota in the last couple of years where the perception of government corruption has been very high, whether that's been EB-5, which has struck us personally here in Aberdeen with one of our residents currently under investigation for something connected with that. We've seen the Gear Up program, and I think it's important that we have legislators, specifically Republican legislators, who are willing to stand up to, I guess you would say, the establishment type Republicans. People who go there, vote their principles, who are able to build relationships like I have. I've passed a few pieces of legislation now, but are willing to stand up to the GOP leadership and say, hey, if we don't have corruption in these issues, we've got a perception of corruption in this, these issues, and we've got to be more transparent. We can't let the people that we serve, a lot of times they talk about uh, elected officials as leaders, and I think they need to take a step back, the elected officials, and realize they're servants of the people. We need to make sure we have a clear, transparent uh, methodology of delivering these messages to the people we serve. So I think that's one big issue. Uh, another issue I'm working on that I've currently got in draft form is right now any municipality gets to enforce their rules and laws three miles outside of their actual jurisdictional bounds. And that affects a lot of farmers and other folks who don't live within city limits but maybe can't build a shed as close to their property line as they would like to. Even though that's okay with the county, it's not okay with the city. These folks in that three mile grace period outside all the cities in South Dakota have legislation without representation. They don't get a voice when voting for the city council, but the city council gets to vote laws that affect them. And I've been to the city council meetings here in Aberdeen where that was brought up. And the biggest theme from our city council members was, hey, this is South Dakota state law problem. This is their fault. They gave us the authority. We're going to use it. And uh, it was kind of fun at one of the meetings, they called me out and said, hey, Representative Dan Kaiser's here, you can go talk to him about it. And sure enough, this citizen came and talked to me, and that's how these great ideas are generated and ultimately bills get passed, is the folks bring concerns to their representatives, we bring it up, and with those relationships we've built over time, we make things happen. So hopefully I answered the question. Wow, I should have wrapped those two in a little bit better because um, both of them are, uh, you know, they go, they go hand in hand. Right now, we have a lot of issues with uh, every year we seem to be passing huge tax increases. Even though there is money to be available through other uh, resources, um, we're still putting that burden on the poor and the middle class in South Dakota. You know, years back, uh, 50s and 60s, a family could be raised with really one person in the household working and the other staying at home. In today's day and age, we can't do that if we wanted to anymore. Both people have to work. And the reason is, is because well over 50% of the money that you're, you have earned is taken by the government for other programs that are meant to help you. Well, what we're finding is it's not really helping us you're just taking more money and forcing both people in the household to work. If both people want to work, that's fantastic. That's great. But the government, federal and state, is becoming so overbearing, uh, it, it's destroying our middle class and even worse on our poor. So I think looking out for the middle class and the poor are our top priorities. I believe it's building relationships. Um, like I said, I've been in the State House two terms now, so four years. And if you look at my past bills, I'm able to speak on the House floor from the heart, from a principled position, and yet not tear down others. I'm still able to work with everybody, build those relationships, and get some pretty tough bills passed. I had one bill uh, two or three years ago now, but uh, I ended up taking on the Attorney General. And that's no small feat when the Attorney General comes out and is uh, at committee testifying against your bill. That takes, again, building those relationships, just having that 
having your word mean something when you shake somebody's hand and say, hey, I'm going to work on this for you. I think that's really important. It's a quagmire. <laughs> we have got um, such a problem in this area. And, you know, they always say that a good compromise, 50, everybody's going to walk away not happy. And we haven't even found a compromise on this issue, and everybody's not happy. You know, we've got a long standing tradition as far as hunting rights and having the availability. If you can access a waterway legally, then you can hunt that. Now what we're seeing in certain counties in the Northeast is the townships are shutting down roads to prevent the sportsmen from accessing water legally. That is, to me, that's pretty underhanded, if not shady. I don't want to be closing roads to, to stop law-abiding citizens from accessing water that legally they have access to and they can hunt on. So I'd like to get into that issue a little bit more and see what, what, uh, what loophole, if you will, the townships are using to close these roads and keep the sportsmen out. Um, I think right now that's probably our biggest, biggest issue. Uh, the last couple of years we haven't had, we've had legislation brought that hasn't passed. The sportsmen have still been able to maintain their hunting right of that water, and I'd like to see that continue. Going forward, we need to make sure with this last uh, last session that that money actually makes it to the teachers. That's been a concern, I know, for a lot of folks. A lot of folks who voted for the bill, um, that was their main concern. This held up a lot of people, that it wasn't devoted to the teachers legally. So I think moving forward, we need to have a strong voice in peer. And again, I've spoke out uh, many a times on the House floor. It was about two years ago they wrapped uh, sparsity and assessments into the general funding for education. And up until that point, that was separate. And by law, you needed to have a 2.1% increase for education. Well, I stood up and made a big stink saying, hey, you just wrapped in edu uh, sparsity and assessments into this so now that 2.1 isn't 2.1. This is, this is numbers games. And I'll tell you what, the folks there are great at numbers games. So we need to make sure we got somebody who's not afraid to stand up to their own party when the time is right and to stand up and express to the citizens, hey, here's what they're doing. They're playing numbers games on us, and that's not appropriate. I know when uh, Video Lottery came about, everybody was promised that money's going to education. And now we see it going to the general fund which some would argue, well, pieces of that make it to education. It's a fair argument. But a lot of that money goes to things like corporate welfare, where we pay rich people to build business in South Dakota. And I don't like taking money through taxes from the poor and the middle class and giving it to rich people. That's something I just happen to be against. I want to make sure education funding is upheld by the bill that was passed last year, and I'm going to fight to make sure that happens.